Good morning. Welcome to the Lord's House for worship this morning. Today we begin a brand new year in the church, a brand new church year. And our new year begins with preparing for Jesus' coming. And today we remember Jesus' second coming, the fact that he will come again at the end of time. The order of service that will guide us as we worship is morning praise. It's printed for you in your worship folder. Let's begin by watching this month's edition of the Wells Connection, after which we'll join together and singing the opening hymn. I'm Wells President Mark Schrader. 100 new home missions in 10 years, starting in 2023. That was the plan proposed and approved at our Synod Convention this past summer. It's an ambitious goal, but for the nearly 175 year history of our church body, starting home mission churches has always been at the core of what we do. Now in the 21st century, home mission planting has developed into a finely tuned process the support and guidance at every step. Recent seminary graduate pastor Tim Walsh and his wife Ruth are in training to restart a mission church in Long Island, New York. But they aren't alone. Today, mission counselor Reverend Mark Burkholz is briefing them on the many ways our synod provides resources and connections for each home mission pastor. My role becomes explaining to the young pastor who all these sources of help are and how each one of them will be an asset to it. It just makes me appreciate how ready, how willing Synod is to um, carry out this work. You know, that we're not just looking to sustain, we're not just looking to um, kind of plateau or stay where we are, but we understand that this, this gospel message is so important. In addition to this initial briefing, an experienced home mission pastor is assigned as a coach to provide one-on-one -on -one guidance for two full years. Plus, there is a representative from their district mission board assigned to help shepherd the home mission. It's exciting to know that there's a lot that we can do and that we get to do it as a family. We go out and meet new people, the wonderful people that are over in New York, Today, lay involvement is key to any home mission start. Lay members often begin working with their district mission board before the home missionary even arrives. The pastor is supported by Boots on the Ground to help bring the good news of Jesus to the community. Cultivating others that have never heard the gospel, haven't even maybe considered it, I think there's definitely a place to, to uh, you know, do some fishing. To help prepare teams of lay people involved in the home mission effort, our Synod partners with a program called Praise and Proclaim to provide personal evangelism training. The pastor just cannot come in and do it all by himself or alone. You know, he needs that core group of people to not only help him with the work, but also be a source of encouragement. I believe that we are entering into an era where there is a dynamic change in evangelism. I think that for churches today, it's not just going out and inviting people to come to church, but I think it's becoming even more important for us to bring the church to the community. There's just a few key words that we really want to keep in mind, and you can, you can be creative with that and go beyond that, but that's good. We need that. Many home missions today start when lay people at an established congregation see an opportunity for gospel outreach in a neighboring community. This ensures a core group is available to help the mission pastor with the effort. Good news in Mount Horeb, Wisconsin. This example started as the daughter congregation of a larger church 15 miles away. 
to not only have really the official support of the whole church body behind you, but to have a specific congregation whose heart is very much into this new church getting started, to be there as one more source of encouragement and really one more source of, of support. Now, seven years in, this mission congregation is ready to take the next step, making plans to move from this rented facility to its own church building. It's a long journey, but our synod provides guidance, support, and expertise at every step. While the goal of opening 100 missions in 10 years from 2023 to 2033 is challenging, with our church body providing various resources and actively supporting missionaries, we can work together to reach this goal. More importantly, we'll be working together to tell more people about the Savior, Jesus Christ. And so we pray that God would bless this effort to His glory. Learn more about Wells Home Missions at wells.net forward slash omissions. Please stand. O oh Lord, open my lips. Hasten to save me, O oh God. Praise be to God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Let us worship him.
You may be seated. Our first lesson is taken from Paul's first letter to the Thessalonians, 1 Thessalonians chapter 3, verses 9 through 13. Those who have received Jesus' promise of forgiveness should continue to live in hope because of his promise to come again. We read, Indeed, how can we thank God enough for you in return for all the joy we have before God on account of you? Night and day we are praying earnestly to see you in person and to supply what is lacking in your faith. May God, our Father himself, and our Lord Jesus direct our way to you. And may the Lord increase your love and make it overflow for each other and for all people, just as ours does for you, so that he may establish your hearts as blameless in holiness before our God and Father, when our Lord Jesus comes with all his saints. This is the word of the Lord. We respond to God's word with our psalm for today. We join together in singing psalm number 24. Our gospel lesson for today is taken from Luke's gospel, Luke chapter 21, verses 25 through 36. This is also the portion of God's word that we will consider during our sermon this morning. There will be signs in the sun, moon, and stars, and on the earth nations will be in anguish, in perplexity, at the roaring of the sea and the surging waves, people fainting from fear and expectation of the things coming on the world. For the powers of the heavens will be shaken, and then they will see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. But when these things begin to happen, stand up and lift up your heads, because your redemption is near. He told them a parable. Look at the fig tree 
and all the trees. As soon as they are sprouting leaves, you can see for yourselves and know that summer is actually near. So also, when you see these things happening, know that the kingdom of God is near. Amen, I tell you. This generation will not pass away until all these things happen. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. Watch yourselves, or else your hearts will be weighed down with carousing, drunkenness, and the worries of this life, and that day may come on you suddenly. For it will come like a trap on all those who dwell on the face of the whole earth. Stay alert all the time, praying that you may be able to escape all these things that are going to happen, and that you may be able to stand before the Son of Man. This is the Gospel of the Lord. The Lord will come again in glory. The Spirit and the Church cry out, Come, Lord Jesus, come. We continue with the children's message. During our church season called Advent, we have the custom at Trinity of displaying the Advent wreath. During the children's messages, during the next several Sundays, we'll talk about what the meaning is with each of the candles in the Advent wreath. The first candle lit today for the first Sunday in Advent is called the prophecy candle. The prophecy candle. What is prophecy? Prophecy is everything that God says through a prophet. Who is a prophet? A man chosen by God to speak his messages. And the Bible has the messages of many prophets. Some of them are Moses, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Micah, and many others. During that time, before Jesus came the first time, about 2,000 years ago, many prophets told facts about Jesus. Let's just take one example. After Adam and Eve sinned, <coughs> God said, to the devil who had led Adam and Eve into sin, an offspring of the woman, a seed of the woman, will crush your head. And God had Moses, the prophet, record that prophecy. With all those prophecies, and we think about them with the prophecy candle, people got ready for the coming of the Savior. For us who live today, in 2021, there are still prophecies in the Bible about Jesus coming again at the end of the world. And we listen to those prophecies and we believe them so that we stay ready for the second coming of Jesus. He came the first time to die on the cross and take away our sins. He'll come the second time to end the world and to take all of us and all believers to live with him forever in heaven. So the first candle, think about it during the week, the first candle on the Advent wreath, the prophecy candle. Let's pray. We thank you, Lord God, for having the prophets record in the Bible the prophecies about the coming of Jesus. Help us always to believe them so that we are ready for Jesus when he comes again. In his name, amen.
Grace, mercy, and peace are yours from God our Father and from our Savior Jesus Christ. Dear fellow believers in our dear Savior, Christ is coming. This is the refrain of Advent, which we will hear many times during the church season. It is the refrain of the time during which we live. Christ is coming. How will we react when Jesus appears in the skies. In the Gospel lesson for today, Jesus refers to himself as the Son of Man. Christ came the first time, and as the Son of Man, he saved us. Christ is coming again, and as the Son of Man, he will end all human history and judge all people. Jesus, the Son of Man, speaks to us lovingly and firmly in the Gospel lesson today so that we are ready for his coming again. We will not be terrified when Jesus appears in the sky with power and great glory. When the Son of Man comes, we will stand before him. We're going to examine Jesus' words in three parts. In the first part, <clears throat> the Lord lays out for us the signs of his coming and encourages us with the promise of redemption. Let's hear him again. There will be signs in the sun, moon, and stars. And on the earth, nations will be in anguish and perplexity at the roaring of the sea and the surging waves. People fainting from fear and expectation of the things coming on the world. For the powers of the heavens will be shaken. And then they will see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. But when these things begin to happen, stand up and lift up your heads, because your redemption is near. As the Lord teaches us, he lays out the signs of his coming. Specific things to look for before Jesus arrives. In the larger context of Luke chapter 21, it seems that these signs here will happen very close to the second coming of the Lord. He says there will be signs in the sky. Signs of such a nature that it will be obvious something is drastically going wrong with the universe. Jesus talks about the powers of the heavens being shaken. And that's all that Jesus tells us. We might speculate. Will the stars that follow a certain pattern in the, in the sky throughout the course of the year, will they suddenly go on in different patterns from night to night? Or the planets that likewise follow uh, specific patterns in the sky that, that people can trace and know will happen, will they suddenly dart off into different places in the sky? Or with things like eclipses that we can predict with, with much certainty because that's how God has so ordered the universe, will they just happen more randomly and at times when people aren't expecting? Drastic things will happen in the sky. Jesus also says there will be signs on the earth. And he speaks specifically to the roaring of the sea and the surging waves. Our minds might picture things like hurricanes and tsunamis that cause people great distress. Perhaps in that time, right before Jesus comes, there will be hurricanes like there have never been before and tsunamis that will wipe out maybe entire islands because they will be so powerful. Whatever is going to happen with the, with the surging of the seas and the waves, it will be tremendous and terrifying. Earlier in this sermon on the end of the world from Luke 21, Jesus spoke about some other signs too that are, that are happening all the time. Signs like nations rising against nations, earthquakes, famines, plagues, persecution against Christians, Jerusalem surrounded by armies and destroyed. These are events, 
past and present and also future. There are signs now that we see and signs that are coming. Jesus predicts fear, deep fear that will grip the hearts of so many people. There will be anguish and perplexity over the tossing of the sea. We observe now how so many people become fearful, and we do too, when there are things like tornadoes and hurricanes and tsunamis. To whatever level those events will occur right before the coming of Jesus, they will cause even more apprehension and fear. Jesus said that people will faint from fear, apprehensive of what is coming. As the earth shakes and rattles, as the sea is full of tempestuous waves, people will become downright terrified. Have any of you ever been in an earthquake? Many people have. People who have experienced earthquakes talk about the great fear that it causes as the earth underneath their feet starts to move. We expect the earth to stay in one place. We expect the stars and the sun and the moon to stay in their places in the sky. But with these very extreme signs that Jesus speaks about, people will be utterly terrified and fainting with fear. And then, people will see the Son of Man, our Lord Jesus, coming in the sky with power and great glory. There will be no mistaking that this is Jesus, not only the Son of Man, but also the Son of God. And there will be no mistaking that this is the end of the world when Christ appears again in glory. But even with everything happening, even with people fainting from fear and apprehensive over what is going on, we and all believers will not be terrified. Instead, as Jesus encourages us, stand up and lift up your heads because your redemption is near. Instead of peril and destruction for us, it will be the moment of redemption. When our Lord Jesus came the first time, he accomplished redemption. Redemption means buying at a price. Jesus, when he came the first time, bought us at a price, the highest price ever, his holy and precious blood, to rescue us from slavery to the devil and sin and death. We are God's redeemed people right now, bought with the precious blood of Christ. When Jesus comes again in glory, then he will redeem us once and for all, finally and fully, soul and body, from this evil world. And we will belong to Jesus, soul and body, forever. We pray in the Lord's Prayer, deliver us from evil. As we continue to live in the evil world, we confront evil all the time, and it's troublesome and bothersome. It causes us distress. We pray to our Heavenly Father, deliver us from evil, and he does every day. When Christ comes again and brings the final redemption, that will be the last time we will ever need to pray that petition from the Lord's Prayer because Jesus will once and for all deliver us from all evil in this world and take us to live with him in heavenly glory. Much is coming, but we're not afraid because Jesus is bringing full and final redemption. So what should we learn from Jesus' words so far? Jesus continues. He told them a parable. Look at the fig tree and all the trees. As soon as they are sprouting leaves, you can see for yourselves and know that summer is actually near. So also when you see these things happening, know that the kingdom of God is near. Amen, I tell you. This generation will not pass away until all these things happen. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. 
Our Lord tells the parable of the fig tree and all the trees. The lesson is simple enough, isn't it? Let's, let's fast forward into next spring. When we see the buds starting to appear on the trees, we know spring has arrived, summer is coming. For us in northern climates, as we have just experienced, when the leaves dry up and fall off the trees, we know here comes winter again. Jesus has a spiritual lesson for us from the simple lesson in nature. When you see these things happening, you know that the kingdom of heaven is near. The kingdom of heaven. That is the glorious and powerful heavenly and eternal rule of Jesus. Right now we live in God's kingdom of grace where we receive God's undeserved love and favor because of Jesus. We are filled with joy over the forgiveness of sins. We delight in peace with God. We look forward to eternal life. When Christ comes again, then there will be the kingdom of glory forever, where we will see Jesus with our own eyes, where he will rule over us in his love and grace, and there will be no enemies at all to cause us any problems forever. The kingdom of heaven will be near. All that Jesus predicts then will certainly happen. Let's listen to some of what he says here. This generation will certainly not pass away until all these things happen. This generation, we might understand that in, in a few different ways. People in Jesus' own generation saw many of those signs already that Jesus spoke about. The disciples saw them. Other people saw them. They saw Jerusalem fall to the Roman armies in 70 A.D. This generation, well, that really speaks to all of humanity for all of time. We, too, see the signs of Jesus coming. And in the way that Jesus uses the term this generation, there's often a hint at this unbelieving generation, there are generations of unbelieving people throughout all of time up until the moment that Jesus comes back. Whatever exact nuance Jesus has to that phrase, this generation, the bottom line is clear. What Jesus says, all the signs that he lays out will certainly happen. Just as the fig tree, when we see the blossoms appearing, so also Christ will come again. And he makes this promise, too. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. Just think about that for a few moments. The oceans will pass away. The rocky mountains will pass away. The sun will pass away. The moon will pass away. All the planets will pass away. All the galaxies in the nighttime sky all the billions and billions of stars will pass away. But Jesus' words will never pass away. Everything he says is true. Everything he says will happen. This is one of those statements from Jesus, isn't it, that helps us really to prioritize what matters, especially as we wait for Jesus to come again. The Lord blesses us with much material prosperity. God gives us so many things from day to day. He has put us on this wonderful planet that he has created. We look out at the sky and see all the magnificent heavenly bodies that the Lord made. But they're not going to last. Jesus' word will last forever. So we give top priority to Jesus' word. Without Jesus' words, we would be lost. We would not know the forgiveness of sins gained by Jesus' blood. We would have no sure hope of eternal life with Christ if we didn't have Jesus' words, but we have them, and they will last forever. So let's always delight in everything that Jesus says. Let's listen very closely to his words recorded in the sacred scriptures Let's believe all of them and let's treasure them more than any physical object 
here on the earth because heaven and earth will pass away. But Jesus' words will last forever. Finally, in Jesus' sermon about the end of the world, he speaks about what we need to do. Watch yourselves, or else your hearts will be weighed down with carousing, drunkenness, and the worries of this life. And that day may come on you suddenly, for it will come like a trap on all those who dwell on the face of the whole earth. Stay alert all the time, praying that you may be able to escape all these things that are going to happen, and that you may be able to stand before the Son of Man. Jesus speaks a clear and direct warning. Watch yourselves. We watch ourselves by remembering constantly that the world is coming to an end and Jesus is coming back. We keep that fact in our hearts and our minds as we live day by day. We also watch ourselves so that we do not become trapped and then weighed down by sin. Jesus lists some of the common sins that trap and weigh people down, carousing and drunkenness and all the worries of life. Christians can fall into those sins too, and many, many more. Christ cautions us to be on our guard against our flesh, against the sinful world around us, and the devil himself. Jesus says, watch yourself. Instead of becoming weighed down by sin, we live in repentance. We confess our sins daily to Christ. We trust in Jesus for full forgiveness earned by his blood, and we strive to live for Christ day by day. That's how we watch ourselves. It is a serious and heartfelt warning from our Savior Jesus, because as he says, that day will come suddenly. The day when the Son of Man arrives will come very suddenly and it will overwhelm so many people. Think about that reality for a moment or two. So many people, even though God has spoken in his word and Jesus has issued his warnings, have no clue about the end of the world and the second coming of Jesus. They don't know what's going to happen, even though God has spoken clearly and given his warnings in his holy word. When that day comes, they will be overwhelmed with fear and dread. And that day, as Jesus says, will come on them like a trap, like an animal caught in a trap and it can't get out and it's going to perish. So will be the coming of the Son of Man for so many people. But we are blessed. We are blessed by Jesus, who speaks to us in the word about his second coming tells us to watch ourselves and to stay alert all the time. So fellow believers in Jesus, let's stay alert as Christ commands. Let's stay alert by praying, praying daily about the coming of Jesus and asking the Lord to keep our hearts ready for that time when Jesus appears in the sky. Let's keep trusting in Christ as our one and only Savior and delighting in everything that he tells us in his holy word. Stay alert, Jesus says. Then that day will not come on you suddenly like a trap. And instead, when the Son of Man comes, we will stand before him and be delivered from this evil world to live with him forever in heaven. Amen. Please stand. The peace of God, which passes all of our understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds and our Savior, Christ Jesus. Amen. Let's sing the song, We Praise You, O God.
In the morning, O Lord, I call to you. Be merciful to me and hear my prayer. Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. As we join together in prayer today, we have two special prayer requests. Kathleen Eichmann, who is the wife of former Trinity pastor, Pastor Paul Eichmann, was called to eternal glory. And so we have a prayer for her family. We also have a prayer for Sandy Castens, whose mother, Eileen Hunter, also passed away recently and now is in her heavenly home. We pray. Lord Jesus, as you have told us in the scriptures, you are coming again. Since your words will last longer than heaven and earth, we know that you are telling us the absolute truth. We thank you for coming once in order to redeem us. We praise you for your second coming in glory to remove us from the sinful world to a life of joy with you. Lead us to take seriously what you have told us so that we, stay, that we may stay ready. Keep us from becoming weighed down by laziness, worldliness, and the anxieties of life. Help us to keep the proper perspective in our day-to-day -day activities, looking beyond our routines to your return. Through the word, sharpen our focus so that we are always watchful for your coming. Gracious and merciful Lord, we thank you for all the mercies with which you blessed Kathleen Eichmann and Eileen Hunter, now fallen asleep in you. We thank you especially for the spiritual blessings you brought them through baptism and preserved as their own through your gospel in word and sacraments throughout their long lives. We ask you to bring your comfort and peace to their families and to all others who mourn for them. Support them and give them spiritual strength through your resurrection and the glorious life to come. Lord of the church, we thank you for another church year beginning today. Let all preaching and teaching in our sanctuary and classrooms faithfully communicate your sacred truths. Move us to come regularly for spiritual nurture and for your word and sacrament. Bring spiritual blessings to us and to many others through your gospel. Amen. O Lord, our Heavenly Father, almighty and everlasting God, you have brought us safely to this new day. Defend us with your mighty power and grant that this day we neither fall into sin nor run into any kind of danger. And in all we do, direct us to what is right in your sight through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord. Amen. Let us praise the Lord. Praise the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. You may be seated as we join together in our closing hymn.
Good morning once again. Good to see all of you here today. It is my pleasure to be back with you today and to share God's word with you. A couple of announcements in our bulletin that I'd like to highlight. I guess the first one's not in the bulletin, but um, we've been undergoing our efforts to get everybody's picture taken for our pictorial directory. If you have not stopped in to do that yet, um, you don't have to worry about an appointment today, but Kim will be in the uh, library ready to take your picture. So if you have time, stop in there and get your picture taken if you have not done so already. Uh, another reminder in the bulletin is there's a voters meeting coming up next Sunday, which will involve elections for our next uh, for years of service coming up. So that's next Sunday at 1145. And then also this coming Thursday, December 2nd from 1 to 6 is our Trinity blood drive. So if you'd like to give blood, you can give some. Uh, there is a reservation there um, in the bulletin. Those are all the announcements I have for you. May the Lord richly bless the rest of your day.